Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. I'm going to propose a hypothetical scenario. Suppose the New England Patriots want to trade up to the number one overall spot so they can take Trevor Lawrence. Obviously, the Jaguars would never allow for such a thing to happen, as no draft package with a Pat Stauffer would be worth it. But what if Robert Kraft calls up the Jaguars and offers to buy the pick from them? It wouldn't be a package of draft picks and players, but rather just a check, where the Patriots would get the first pick and the Jaguars would get a boatload of money. How much money do you think the first overall pick would go for, especially in a draft class like this one? There's a reason I bring that up, and that's because one year, a team tried to do that. In 1982, the New England Patriots had the number one pick. Washington really wanted the top spot, and Washington was prepared to acquire the pick by writing a big fat check. This is the story behind the time that a team tried to buy the number one pick in the NFL draft. There's three important questions we have to ask ourselves with this entire ordeal. First, why did Washington want the first pick so badly? Second, why did they try this method of buying it out instead of just trying to trade for picks and players? And third, how did everything work out in the end, both for Washington and New England? And to understand why Washington wanted this pick, we need to understand this draft class. Many draft experts consider the 1982 NFL Draft to be one of the weaker classes up top, outside of running back, which was absolutely loaded with guys like future Pro Bowler Gerald Riggs and future Hall of Famer Marcus Allen, this was a pretty thin class. Dick Steinberg was the director of player development for the Patriots at the time, and he said on the draft class, the draft is not as deep as usual, nor does it have the quality of most drafts. There are not very many competitive big men in this draft, and we don't have any defensive backs rated in the first two rounds. One unidentified team graded all the prospects on a scale of 1 to 10. And unlike 1981, considered a very good and deep class up top at the time, this team only had one player ranked above a 7. That player, the clear-cut, blue-chip prize in the draft. And that was Texas defensive lineman Kenneth Sims. To say that he was dominant with the Longhorns would be an understatement. The 6'5", 270-pound lineman was described by his coach, Fred Akers, as the finest lineman in the country. He had six tackles for a loss in one game against SMU. He was a two-time All-American. He won the Lombardi Award as a senior, given to the best lineman, and being the first Texas player to ever receive this honor. Sims was the clear-cut number one choice in the draft, and Washington wanted him badly. They needed to improve their pass rush. After going 8-8 in 1981 in Joe Gibbs' first year as head coach, they felt that if they were going to get to the Super Bowl, it was going to require a drastic improvement defensively. Washington had a defense that finished in the bottom half of the league in points allowed. They only sacked the quarterback 32 times, which ranked in the bottom 10. Two of their starting defensive linemen from 1981 were going to be 32 years old when the 1982 season rolled around. And three of their final five games, they recorded less than two sacks. Sims was the number one pick. Sims would help their pass rush on paper. Just one problem. Washington didn't have the first pick, so they tried to do everything in their power to get it, even if it meant buying it outright. All right, so we've already established why Washington wants Sims, since they had a below average pass rush, and since he was the best player in a pretty weak class. Washington would have had the 14th pick in the draft that year. However, Bobby Bether did not believe in first round picks. More often than not, Washington would trade their first round pick away to get a veteran or acquire more picks later on. For some perspective, from 1969 to 1990, Washington had a grand total of three picks in the first round. In 2000, the New York Jets had more first round picks in one year than Washington had in an over two decade long stretch. Sure enough, 1982 was no exception. In 1981, Washington and the Los Angeles Rams worked out a deal where the Rams would give up a second round pick, a third round pick, and two fifth round picks in exchange for Washington's first pick in 1982. Now, in fairness to Washington, this trade worked out incredibly well for them, as one of the players they got was Russ Grimm, who was maybe the anchor of the Hogs' offensive line, made four straight Pro Bowls from 1983 to 86, and would be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But this move left them without any ammo draft pick-wise that they could use to get that top pick from the Patriots in a trade down. And the Patriots, much like Washington, knew the situation at hand. They knew that Sims was the blue chip prospect, and the only one in this class. They needed to improve their pass rush desperately, as they only had 20 sacks in 1981, which was the second fewest in the league, only ahead of the Baltimore Colts. They were presented with a golden ticket by getting this pick, and no package 
especially one that would have left them without a first round pick entirely in the class, was going to convince New England to move out of that top spot. So Washington went with a completely different route. They offered money. Owner Billy Sullivan was strapped for cash in the 1980s compared to most owners, and this would really come to light a few years later after his disastrous investment in the victory tour with the Jacksons. Washington owner Jack Ken Cook called Sullivan up and offered him $2.5 million for the pick. Now, while that might seem like a really low number, remember that back then, the average salary in the league was slightly over $90,000. $2.5 million was enough to cover the salaries for 27 players, or more than half the guys on the roster. It'd be the equivalent of a team offering over $107 million for the first pick today. In that context, nine figures for a guy who had never even played a snap in the NFL, and could be a complete bust for all we know, might be enticing. And also remember that back then, there was no salary cap, and you could pay guys whatever you wanted. However, New England declined the deal. They were dead set on taking Kenneth Sims with their first pick, and Washington's offer for $2.5 million wasn't enough to change that. But how did everything work out with Sims once he got into the NFL? Well, it's not great. Look, in terms of first overall picks, there have been guys that were way worse than Sims. There have been guys that flamed out of the league in spectacular fashion, and guys that never looked even remotely serviceable. Sims lasted with the Patriots for eight seasons. He played close to a decade with the team that drafted him. Having said that, yeah, he wasn't very good. In those eight seasons, he only recorded 17 sacks. His best season was in 1985, when the Patriots made the Super Bowl, and he finished with five and a half sacks. Outside of that season, there was not a single year where Sims had four or more sacks. He was supposed to be dominant. He was supposed to fix New England's pass rush, and he did not do that in the slightest bit. Sims' career came to an unceremonious end during the 1990 offseason, when Sims was caught speeding after going 75 miles an hour. When the policeman pulled him over and Sims reached into his pocket to grab his license, a packet of cocaine fell onto the ground, leading him to getting arrested. Let this be a lesson to everyone. Don't commit two crimes at the same time. Sims was already on thin ice with new head coach Rod Rust for showing up to minicamp out of shape earlier in the offseason, and this arrest was the straw that broke the camel's back. Sims was cut two weeks after the arrest, and never played in the NFL again. That whole ordeal was an omen to just how bad the Patriots would be in 1990, which might be the most dysfunctional season in the post-merger history of the NFL. As for Washington, yeah, they didn't need Sims at all. They dodged a bullet. Washington won the Super Bowl that year, thanks in part to a dominant pass rush that finished third in the league with 32 sacks over the nine-game strike shortened season. Dexter Manley would become one of the most feared pass rushers of the 80s and was instrumental in Washington's strong play over the decade. And that defense that ranked in the bottom half of the league in 1981 shot all the way up to first during that 1982 campaign. But this whole situation poses an incredible hypothetical scenario. Obviously not for $2.5 million, since that's a chump change in the NFL today, but let's adjust that like I did before to account for the average player's salary and change it to $107 million. Would you take the deal? Is there any draft where you would have taken the deal? How much money would it take for you to give away the number one overall pick? These are all interesting hypotheticals that 40 years ago, Washington and New England had to ask themselves as part of a bizarre draft scenario that we might never see again. Be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and my cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jarrogator 9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping with the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.